Melbourne's Metro Tunnel Project is Melbourne's biggest rail infrastructure undertaking since the City Loop was constructed in the 1970s and 1980s. While it will end up costing around $13 billion once finished, it will deliver significant benefits, primarily through adding network capacity in the city by taking the Pakenham, Cranbourne and Sunbury lines out of the City Loop, as well as through adding five new underground stations. This video will show you what publicly visible progress has been made on it as of February 2024. We begin the video approaching the western entrance to the tunnel at South Kensington. The two tracks in sight are the up and down Sunbury lines. This footage was taken from a Frankston bound Werribee line train. Here is the junction for the metro tunnel. Notice the bulks that have been placed over the line. These are removed whenever test trains need to enter the tunnel. Clearly the western entrance is all but complete. The majority of the remaining works listed on the website relate to testing, demonstrating that construction is essentially finished here. Here's another look at the decline structure, this time from a Sunbury bound train passing South Kensington. This structure was built over what was formerly a long, thin car park. And here's a closer look at the tracks descending into the tunnel. Note the transition from there being ballast underneath the tracks to the ballastless track in the tunnel. Ballastless track requires less maintenance but is more expensive to install up front, so it's an apt choice for what will immediately become an extremely busy rail corridor with few maintenance windows. The wall of the decline structures had this artwork installed on it, with statistics observed from a day spent at the adjacent JJ Holland Park. Finally, this already graffitied building here will be used for emergency egress, and I believe it was constructed on the site of where the tunnel boring machine retrieval shaft was. Let's now move to the first new station at Arden. If you were to walk between North Melbourne Station and Macaulay Station, Arden would be about at the halfway mark between the two. According to the government, major construction is now complete at Arden, and it looks it. The station building is done, it just needs to be fitted out with retail outlets. The Mikey Barriers are all in place and are even all turned on. The bus stops are in place, although we don't yet know what bus routes will be stopping here. There are bike lanes, there are heaps of bike spaces, the pedestrian crossings ready but fenced off, there's even this fake bird of prey to scare smaller birds away. There's something quite surreal about standing here and having a pretty much complete train station in front of you, but just no one around. Like at the moment there really isn't anything going on in this area apart from a few industrial activities but very soon it'll be bustling full of commuters and um, in not well not too much longer after that there'll be a lot of urban renewal in this area. Something else that struck me about Arden is the large amount of open space. I wonder how much of it will be retained and how much of it will be developed on. There are plans to build a large new medical precinct in the area, capitalising on what will be a two minute ride from Melbourne's existing medical precinct in Parkville. My prediction is that Arden will be the least busy of the stations for a good while, but that's the nature of an urban renewal project like this. This is a rare instance of the government putting in the infrastructure before development, rather than the other way, and I'm sure Arden will prosper as a result. The next stop along is Parkville, which could well be the Metro Tunnel's most useful addition to the network through finally bringing heavy rail to Melbourne University and the Health Precinct. Let's start at the main entrance on Grattan Street, serving Melbourne University. The entrance was designed to illuminate the underground concourse below with as much natural light as possible, hence its glass design. These skylights here are being used for the same purpose. The canopy looks finished, with all of its windows in place. The current temporary pathway across Grattan Street takes you right beside this entrance, so you can have a great peek in. All the escalators here are in place, and it doesn't look like there's that much more work to do to finish this entrance. The next few shots look eastbound on Grattan Street. This area is currently full of construction activity. However, once again, it doesn't seem too far away from being finished. The traffic lights and the lampposts are all relatively recent additions to the area, and you can see that the bus shelters have already been erected. 
I don't believe the planned bus changes are publicly accessible yet, but the multitude of bus stops here could give us some clues. In my opinion, they should definitely keep one of the 401 or 402 services, which currently stops south of here on Pelham Street, as they are a time competitive way for Upfield and Craigieburn line commuters to access the activity centres in Parkville, and could quite possibly still be taking the train into Melbourne Central and changing trains for one going here at State Library. Before we move to Royal Parade, this building has also risen up in University Square, which I believe includes a chiller plant. According to the development plan, this will also have retail space, so it'll be interesting to see what comes of it when finished. Now on Royal Parade, let's first look back at Grutton Street towards where we were. And from here you can appreciate how complete this at-ground part of the Parkville station site is looking. The authorities remain tight-lipped and are conservatively saying Grattan Street will reopen with the opening of the station in 2025, but I wouldn't be surprised if Grattan Street opened a bit earlier than that. Let's now check out some of the other entrances. This is Royal Parade's eastern entrance, again serving the university. The canopy's done, but I think the fit-out needs a lot more work than the main Grattan Street entrance that we were at before. Here's Royal Parade's western entrance, serving the hospitals. The escalators are definitely in, but again there's a lot of work to be done on them. Another thing that has been installed is this station sign, which again makes it feel like we aren't very far away from opening. Between these two entrances on Royal Parade sits a new tram stop. While this interchange will not be as direct as the one at Anzac, it will still be very easy crossing the road and heading down into the station. If Metro 2 is ever built, it will most likely bisect the Metro Tunnel here, running underneath Royal Parade, with passengers feeding into the underpass. Finally, here is Grattan Street's western entrance, serving the hospitals and the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. It too has its escalators in, and its canopy lifted into place. I'm not going to count this as another entrance, but there is also this lift on the western side of Royal Parade, south of Grattan Street which I'm assuming will feed into the underpass. State Library is the next station, and there is plenty to see here too. Let's start on Franklin Street, next to the Melbourne City Bards. This is going to be the site of one of the two entrances from above. Clearly, the large shed is still there, so it's difficult to know how much has been done underneath it, but peeking in, we can just see what looks like an ancillary building has been installed. Throughout construction, this pedestrian laneway has been retained, primarily for RMIT students to move around their campus. And here is the same shed, but from Victoria Street. Now let's head back to where we were before and cross to the other side of Swanston Street. Here, they are now actually demolishing the shed, revealing some more ancillary buildings. There isn't going to be an entrance on this side, which I think is a shame. In places like Singapore, there are so many entrances that you seldom have to cross roads at all to access stations regardless of where you are, so it's a shame that we didn't do that here. This section of Franklin Street will have an expansive pedestrian promenade, retaining a narrower road for the cars. Before we visit the other construction sites here at State Library, I want to first discuss some exciting tram use. Just like the bus changes, the authorities have hitherto been very tight-lipped about tram changes, but recently we finally got some limited clarity. This strange little parcel of land, used by this tram to terminate, is going to be converted into a pocket park. But don't worry, they're not going to be removing this rarely used Victoria Street line. Instead, they will implement new left turning tracks here, and will upgrade the tracks on Victoria Street. Currently, trams then have to swing right onto Elizabeth Street if they use this short little connection, but they are going to build a new line straight across Elizabeth Street onto the other side of Victoria Street where the 57 runs. They explicitly say that this could one day connect to the Arden Precinct, foreshadowing a future tram extension there. Now we're at the Beckett Street Shed. It too has a little pedestrian laneway, helping people to access other parts of RMIT. There are no signs of this shed being pulled down just yet, once it is though, this end of a Beckett Street will permanently close to road traffic where the shed is now, and a pocket park will be built. Moving further down Swanston Street, we find ourselves at the Latrobe Street entrance, which isn't hiding itself at all anymore. It's an impressive structure and is set to have an overstation development to capitalise on the space above it. 
the tram stop in front of it has been permanently relocated to the other side of Swanston Street. Underneath La Trobe Street is where the connection to Melbourne Central will be. This is currently hidden behind these informative hoardings, but once finished will offer a paid and seamless connection between the two. The next station along the line is Town Hall, and unfortunately for you viewers, there's still not too much I can show you. Town Hall was where they had to retrieve some of the TBMs, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's the least progressed station. Nevertheless, there has still been a lot of progress, even if it's not visually obvious. City Square no longer has a shed covering it, and it'll be home to one of the entrances. Then there's this other large construction site, behind Young and Jackson's Hotel, where the old Maccas used to be. It's hard to peek in here and get a look at what's there, but this will eventually be home to several retail spaces and overstation developments. Also nearby will be the connection into Flinders Street Station. The De Grey Street exit from Flinders Street will be used for this connection, hence its current closure and all these hoardings on the platforms. Campbell Arcade, those quirky shops that used to be at the end of the DeGrave Street exit, will also be reinstated. Finally, here is the last Town Hall station entrance into Federation Square. The shed is still up here, and they don't seem like they're preparing to demolish it just yet. Let's move now to the final new station at Anzac. We start on a southbound tram. This is the main road, which we are crossing over. Note the white canopy in the centre of the screen. This is one of three station entrances. Unlike at Parkville, where the colour blue is used, Anzac uses green, reflecting the expanses of public parkland nearby. Let's now have a look from a northbound tram. We pass numerous ancillary buildings, including ventilation buildings and chiller plants. Now in view is the Western Station entrance. The canopy clearly hasn't been finished yet, but I doubt it will be that long until it's revealed. I went to Anzac Station just after it opened, and not much has changed on the tram interchange itself. But let's have a look around in case you haven't seen it before. The canopy is extremely large and long. It's like a really big ironing board. Unfortunately, despite this huge canopy, there's actually a distinct lack of shade currently for passengers using the tram stop, so it was pretty sweltering while I was filming this video. You can also just see through this crack into the station entrance, where the escalators look all ready to go. This is another look at those ancillary buildings from before. And now a look at some more ancillary buildings on the northern side. You might notice this curious tram track heading into the construction site. There is still no public information on whether this line will indeed be used, but I'm very hopeful that they will reinstate the old Domain Road tram line, formerly used by Route 8 trams, and retain the new, diverted line down Turak Road. Now in Albert Road, where they'll be adding in a small park along with the eastern entrance. Like at Arden, the bike lanes are already in place, and you can get a bit of an idea as to what it will look like once finished. I'm quite intrigued by that cylindrical glass structure. It looks as though it will be a glass lift. There is another one of these at the eastern entrance on Domain Road, coupled with a more complete canopy. For the last part of this video, let's head to the eastern entrance at South Yarra. We start on a Cranbourne bound train just after South Yarra station. In terms of the entrance itself, nothing much has changed in the past couple of years. The tracks were slewed into their current alignment in 2020 the more recent change was the fit out of the tunnel itself with tracks, connecting to the earlier provided junction.
Again, notice the easily removable bulks across the tracks. Let's have another look from a city-bound train. We were on the track on the right before, which must be taken slowly because it is quite a sharp bend. This track will predominantly be used by V-Line trains once the tunnel opens, and perhaps the occasional footy special. Now arriving at South Yarra. Change here for Sandringham Services. We're heading over the Metro Tunnel right now. It was a complex entrance to construct as it had to duck under the up Dandenong line, both the Frankston lines and both the Sandringham lines. Building a station here would have made it even more complicated, so it's unsurprising that they decided to snub South Yarra of a metro tunnel connection. Although, part of the economic justification was that it would require the demolition of part of the jam factory, which in hindsight wouldn't have mattered too much as it has been in decline anyway. Now, let's have a bit more of a look around the place. Lover's Walk has been reopened, including this nice little pocket park, and the William Street Bridge, which was demolished to allow for the construction of the entrance, has been reinstated. Here is another look at the junction for the Metro Tunnel. First from Lover's Walk, and now from the other side, from William Street. For all intensive purposes, this entrance is done. Trains can, and have, entered it for testing. I don't think it will look any different once it opens. The only thing that they still seem to be working on here is the South Yarra Siding Reserve. This park was used extensively during construction, and they've actually built an underground substation beneath it. Most of the reserve has been finished for several months now and has laid dormant. Hopefully the council gets it open soon for locals to enjoy. Finally, there is this colourful ancillary building, which will provide emergency egress for the tunnel. So that's where the Metro Tunnel is at as of late February 2024. Of course, I only showed you the at and above ground progress, which is a fundamentally flawed so-called progress update for a project that is inherently underground. Nevertheless, we can make a few conclusions from what we have seen in the video. The two entrances and Arden Station are essentially finished. Parkville and Anzac stations are not far behind. We already know that the test trains are running along the line which means most of the railway infrastructure is also finished. That means that there are two broad things which will hold up its opening. The first is the completion of State Library and Town Hall stations. These were objectively the toughest to construct, as they were done using trinocular cabins, rather than cut and cover like the other stations, which was a huge task. They are also in the middle of a very busy city. Nevertheless, I don't think this will take too long. Work has progressed well according to the Metro Tunnel's videos. The other thing that could hold up completion is the testing phase. There will inevitably be some problems, especially because of the implementation of new technologies like high capacity signalling and platform screen doors, which Melbourne hasn't had until now. There haven't seemed to have been any major problems so far though, so let's hope that continues. The leaked internal plan has the Metro Tunnel opening in late September of this year, which is only seven months away. My uninformed opinion is that that seems a bit ambitious. Realistically, the best we can probably hope for is November or December in 2024, but otherwise, I don't think it will be too long into 2025 when we can finally explore all these new stations for ourselves. They're still officially saying 2025, but obviously they would want to be conservative because delays attract way more negative attention than early finishes attract positive attention. I would like to thank the Channel Transport vlog for the inspiration. He made some great videos like this one last year, so I'd urge you to check them out. He also is providing some very interesting updates on the progress of the Sydney Metro project up north. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope we all get to ride in the tunnel soon ourselves.